afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining. Christopher, thanks for you. Uh, it is afternoon. Thanks for tuning in. It's exciting to be here. Thanks for having me. Nice to have you. What do we see in your background? Is this your media uh, lab? It is actually, it is the floor of the media lab. So you can see, so for those who are maybe in the neighborhood or now with, you know, risk, travel restrictions being hopeful at the bay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to be very happy to welcome you here, guys, and give you a tour. Yeah, that's one of the floors of the lab. <laughs> I, I guess you know Hiroshi Ishii. Yes, I, actually, that's the floor that he faces, his, uh, his lab faces. <laughs> so he had a, a huge exhibition at Ars Electronica. So a couple yeah. of floors just about work of the media lab some years ago. Mm -hmm. It was fascinating. Yeah, yeah it's, it's super exciting. Yeah, super exciting. Yes. And, and you are responsible for bringing BCI and the EG stuff into the media lab? Yes, I actually joined like five, six years ago. And there was um, a decent amount of research, but it was more, I would say, signal processing heavy and more I would say in, there is also ECOGs and like more implantable systems but now we are definitely uh, having you know whole team and actually beyond the team already moving forward with more variable out of the lab you know easily deployable systems and um, mm -hmm. we'll be excited to talk about some of the stuff we have done but yeah definitely uh, we are really on it. Okay, we we are running it, our BCI hackathon Brain IO on the on the weekend, and you are yes. running something pretty similar, Brainy IO. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but that is the company. I will mention it real brief. Yes, <laughs> it's funny. Um, please click on the share screen button. Yes, to Let share your presentation. Hopefully, you can all see that. I and can already now... see it. Great. And we are all looking forward to hear from an MIT Media Lab expert what you are doing over there. And maybe yes. I should also mention that you you were winning this huge uh, award, UNESCO award from L'Oreal, isn't it? Yes, yes, it was. Yes. Well deserved. And we are looking forward to <laughs> your presentation. You. <laughs> thank you so much, Christoph. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, my name is Natalia Kosmina, for those who are just joining us. And uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, I think we have a decent amount of time together, around one hour. I will leave enough time for questions. But just in case there is something that I would not have time to answer, or you want to know maybe about some other projects that I will not be able to touch base on in this presentation, feel free to send an email. So what we're gonna talk about today is, I would say two kind of directions. We're gonna talk about form factors a bit, specifically glasses and a head. And we also will look in on two use cases, the XR use case and a tech use case. Uh, just as Christoph already mentioned my background, but just you know, for the full disclaimer, uh, I did my PhD in France. I'm actually French, and uh, I was part of a, a HCI team in Grenoble. And then I moved uh, to do my postdoc at Inriaren with Nathalie Kuyer and the team. Uh, and uh, I was exploring further along brain sensing, uh, but more, you know, pushing it out of the lab direction, specifically. Obviously, we are direction that the team is uh, undertaking there. I also founded my company, uh, Brain Operation 2015. And in 2017, since 2017, I actually am with MIT and I'm a research scientist at MIT. Also, as a full disclaimer, I am an advisor at MSR Redmond, United States. And also, I am an advisor to different early stage biotech startups. And you can see on the right of this slide, Again, for the full transparency, some of the government and non-government institutions and organizations uh, for profit and non-profit who actually supported the work over all of these years. Thank you to them. So my whole professional uh, career in life, I'm working with head-mounted displays, head-worn eyewear, uh, e-wear, and I'm pretty sure all of you right now, for those who I can see actually, but also everyone who is joining us virtually, wearing something. AirPods, pair of glasses, big over-ear headphones. Maybe someone is wearing additional uh, on uh, head sensors. Uh, so you definitely understand what I'm talking about here. But 
as you have guessed, spoiler alert, we had the ABCI Spring School. Uh, we're going to talk, obviously, about those devices being uh, enhanced with different brain sensing components. We're going to specifically talk about non-invasive EEG uh, sensing in this presentation. And uh, throughout uh, the years of my work, uh, I have been doing and I'm doing a lot of different applications, a lot of end-to-end -end systems. Uh, we have been looking at the robotic control, specifically drone control, smart home control, with uh, controlling different appliances. Uh, I do work with miners, so BCN miners, a uh, pretty emerging topic. Uh, we do a lot of extreme or restrained or refined environments like car sensing, cockpits, etc. with a project that is called Attentive U, I will touch base on today. Uh, a lot of work in XR, going to also touch base on it. Uh, some work in gaming and priming, uh, also brain switch work, and last but not least, neurofutures, I'm going to also touch upon uh, at the end of this talk. Uh, we're going to only talk more in depth about two, but as I mentioned, please feel free to uh, send questions, ask questions about other work. However, Obviously, you have uh, already heard from a lot of experts uh, before myself, but just to make sure that, you know, we are posing the context here, the context of the work uh, of the lab uh, I am at and also of my work uh, is really looking at variable and preferentially wireless sensing and something that a user is varying on everyday basis or potentially as part of their work or educational environment. And I do like to refer to brain computer interfaces uh, more like biosignal computer interaction and more specifically treating it as a BCI, as API. If you're gonna just look at the head, oh, this is a prime focus of this talk. We can do a lot of interesting uh, measures which can yield a lot of interesting uh, information. Specifically on the occipital, uh, if you're gonna put electrodes, we can pick up some imagination of some basic objects, some visual imagery. If you're gonna go along towards the forehead, we can pick up interesting measurements of engagement, external, internal attention, uh, auditory attention, if you're gonna go close it around the ears, but also actually towards the eyes, the eye movements. If you're gonna touch on the tip of the nose, you might know that the temperature would actually indicate if the nose is cold that you are being engaged with as the topics that you're being exposed to right now. So actually listen to what I'm saying. And of course, last but not least, as there is a huge, the biggest uh, organ of our body, the skin, that can give us measures of cognitive uh, load among others. So there's quite a few different uh, sensing modalities, different modalities we can pick up from. And again, this is just the head. Um, so heart rate, EDA, EUG, electrocardiography, EEG, NIRS, uh, we have just heard about uh, temperature measures. But I specifically focus in these measures on looking how we can support the user in their cognitive and mental states over everyday life. And as I already mentioned, I do specifically look at EEG, but also we're gonna to touch upon on EOG or electrocardiography as additional modality. And there is a lot of uh, cool and interesting prototypes, works, papers that have been published throughout the years. Uh, but however, of course, we are more aiming towards tomorrow where we can have more seamless possibly visible, invisible interactions where we can actually interface and maybe seamlessly move between real reality and virtual reality, metaverse, Xverse, however you call it, and that would support the user uh, in whatever decision-making processes they are facing at the moment. However, there's definitely a lot of challenges you can still look at. And of course, the challenges are, as you know, Still, a lot of the systems are pretty expensive. Some of them do require a lot of setup time. They are sometimes are pretty heavy, not always the most comfortable setup to have on your head. Uh, you can see on the last picture, I look like an octopus. Uh, and definitely some of them are still being wired. This, is, this does not mean that these solutions cannot be put outside of the lab, but it's definitely very, very complicated. And however, 
state of the art, a lot of amazing and cool work actually shows us that uh, you sometimes don't need all of these electrodes. A lot of work, and I do uh, suggest you check in all of these uh, works in the paper and state of the art uh, republished. I will point the references towards the end, but you can take the screenshots if you're interested. Uh, this is the paper from last year we published, where, for example, a lot of our collaborators, a lot of uh, other lab research labs, they're just using one or two or three electrodes, up to six electrodes sometimes, to pick up SSVP or P300. In some cases, it's just one. And they do integrate and interface them with different AR and XR headsets overall. And the users in all those papers do claim that it would have been great if it would be more comfortable. They would love to have it if the integration was more seamless. So that's what we try to do actually. And this is our first use case, XR use case. So uh, colleagues like Puss and Wartman, uh, but uh, also a lot of others, but they're definitely pushing ahead. Uh, and I do recommend checking those papers. Um, they do explore, uh, they did explore further along a way of measuring internal or external attention of the user. So for those who might not familiar with that concept, what is internal attention? Examples are the following. I'm gonna ask you, can you think about uh, what clothes you have been wearing two days ago? Or can you do a mental calculus? Or can you name all the animals and birds starting with the letter O or D, like maybe O, and then you would need to start with the letter L, like clear part, and deer, et cetera, et cetera. These are examples of internal attention. External attention, uh, um, I'm asking you to look at this super cute puppy right now. Uh, enlighten your mood, hopefully, but also that would be an example of external attention. You are observing the stimuli. Or I would ask you to tell me how many instances of a letter B is here on the slide at the moment. So these are just a couple of examples of external attention. Uh, further along, there was a lot of interesting work done using covert visual special attention. This is the work that is pioneered, was heavily pioneered by Tonin, and I highly recommend uh, checking their papers, uh, specifically where eye movements are not used to pay attention to the stimulus, which could appear at different parts of the screen, specifically like left and right parts of the screen. And finally, last but not least, there was some works that start to appear on using imagery or imagination of movements or objects, basic, usually binary classification for, for example, creativity application. So all of this is great. However, and this is all published, but it was all done in our 2D space. And the idea here is that's great, but can we potentially leverage these amazing, these great applications and use cases and test them within the XR setup, specifically something like AR headset. This was not attempted before. And uh, we have partnered with uh, HoloLens team at Microsoft and uh, we specifically used HoloLens 2. And we have enhanced it with a clip on that we have designed and printed that can actually sit pretty tightly if you have seen a HoloLens 2 or maybe you have it, your own one, you would see that there's actually two parts of it on the forehead and also back of the head, which holds the electronics. And these parts actually can uh, fit additional clip-on parts, which uh, we can actually print, design, and as you have guessed, add some of the electrodes there. So here is how the clip on looks. Uh, on the left side of myself, you can see an image where it's printed in black. So you potentially can even not really see it. I don't know if you actually can see it, but on the right, we did print it in blue in the thicker version. It doesn't need to be that thick, uh, but it's more visible here. And uh, here you can see again, a, a bit of the close-ups. And here you can see the version, again, a thicker version in blue, uh, printed in blue on the forehead and on the back of the head, how they look like. We have used the GTX Unicorn system for that. You know, you, you have maybe heard about it already. It can be actually taken fully off from the little cap it comes with, and you can actually use and interchange the electrodes as you see fit, and which is great, and it is wireless, which is great. So what we have done here, actually, we have designed several 
little applications, specifically the three that I have mentioned, that we're looking at imagination, looking at external internal attention, and also looking at court visual special attention. We have actually replicated the previous papers from Puzer, from Tonin Labs, and from other uh, papers to actually try to really get as close as possible to their results and their setup so we can actually compare using this system, which again, supposed to work, of course, there is nothing significantly different. However, it is used in a new 3D environment. It, now it has this potential further integration that might help the user, ensures the comfort of the user, and as far as it can ensure the comfort of the user, that could potentially also lead to a more positive outcomes. So here I'm just gonna play you a couple of videos, how uh, it looked like uh, when the user is experiencing the um, experiencing this, the task, the setup. So the first one, we call it what you think is what you get. So uh, you need to imagine an object uh, and there is no visual stimulation for this object happening. Meaning that it's not P300, it's not SVP, it's based uh, uh, exclusively on the visual imagery. So the objects are very different in color and shape and form, and we have several papers published about that and also from other colleagues, why that would work and how would we do that. And electrodes for this are specifically on the exhibital, so we don't really care that much about the forehead electrodes there. On the right side of the screen, external internal attention, oh, let me sure it plays again. Uh, you would see the very same task, except in this case, user will get a ball. So they don't need to imagine the ball anymore. They will get the ball automatically if they are being externally engaged within the environment. So there is no one wondering, they're not thinking anything else, and they would actually get the ball. If they don't do that, they will get a cube and they will lose a game. So it's a little, very basic game. You need to end up with the number of balls outperforming the number of cubes. That's it. And then finally, the core visual special attention, you, again, the setup, as I mentioned, and the idea that you have two stimuli, they could be any stimuli, but the most classic, just like round, simple objects, uh, where you would actually cue to which side you need to pay attention to and the main goal simple goal of the user look straight and do not move your eyes towards the stimuli of the choice or of the interest that's why it's very interesting to use this type of uh, attention within the x applications but we're going to talk about this in the conclusions because it's ultimately uh, brain interaction itself so that's not going to be used with any additional modalities. Uh, Tony and others and ourselves in our paper, we did uh, actually investigate the correlations between the uh, eye movements and the stimuli positioning uh, to ensure that the selection is not done and it's by no means correlated with where the user was looking and they did follow instructions. Uh, that's actually also the beauty of having this integration with the EEG and HoloLens too. Uh, for those of you who might not know, HoloLens 2 does have an integrated eye tracking system. So this is how a uh, uh, setup looks like. But uh, as I mentioned, for those who know uh, Cortical Special Attention, it's a classic um, setup that we have just replicated from the original paper. Uh, of course, uh, there is a lot of different things we can talk about, and this is just some of the types of attention, uh, but there is so much more. Uh, there is definitely um, internal, external, corridor special, but there is also auditory attention, cocktail body problem. There is a uh, visual attention between different types of stimuli. For example, uh, if you see two pieces of art, like you see right now, uh, Bastier and uh, Mona Lisa of Da Vinci, or you see two types of brands, for example, uh, these are coffee brands uh, that are pretty popular in the United States. Um, and all of this yields to two important questions. Uh, first, so why it works and how does it work? And second, when you talk about attention, it's really important to make sure that 
you explicitly mention which type of attention you are trying to investigate. We have seen this pretty often, actually, that um, there is just a claim, oh, we're measuring attention, like what attention, why, which features, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something we, uh, I like to highlight in my talks when I'm talking about it, uh, because that's extremely important to actually identify what are you trying specifically to measure to capture the phenomena and to explore. Again, visual attention is different from visual imagination, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We also got a paper accepted about how we can use uh, tracking of uh, visual attention and auditory attention with this very same setup and the paper just got accepted. So it's not out yet, but it will be soon. However, with all of this work on embracing in trying to move their electrodes and the whole system outside the lab, we still have a setup which is still pretty specific. It might definitely meet the goals of the lab, They're doing research outside the lab for sure. Uh, the price is definitely decreased, the setup uh, time is definitely decreased, the comfort of the user is increased. And again, I do encourage you to check the paper, follow the details and all the results. However, not everyone might be willing to investigate their. XR setup specifically with their screen on and not everyone might need to use it or have access to this piece. Uh, of course, it can be integrated with VR. Uh, however, we also have been exploring on what else is out there that we can actually explore for measuring attention. There is definitely a lot of around ear pieces. There's a lot of, again, integration with VR headsets that is coming out and already have been published. There is a lot of headphones form factors actually are appearing and uh, like entering brain, etc. There is definitely uh, eye masks and obviously a lot of different headbands specifically for uh, targeting sleep interactions. And over the past decade, we definitely moved forward significantly in this direction. Uh, there is definitely a lot of our opportunities now to do sensing, which is really much more comfortable, much less intrusive. However, let's be super honest, neither decade ago, not today, you're not gonna run outside neither with these two. Maybe if we pay you for the study, you might work with it or maybe you will take it home. Yeah, okay, let's be honest. Maybe you have a very specific setup, like you're a sportsman or something like that. You might be accommodated and accustomed to using these types of like headbands, etc. But it still stays a bit intrusive and it will yield a lot of questions. Why are you wearing this and what you're wearing? And again, the idea is actually critical in what we are trying to address as a challenge. Um, because for a lot of research and more, I would say, fundamental science, you might actually need to stay within the lab. And that might be what you need to do because you're not sure what you're looking for, not sure about the features, you're not sure about uh, the resolutions, etc., etc. However, we are trying to address, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, attention, cognitive states, fatigue, mental states. And because of that, you want to measure them in the time the task is being produced, meaning in the time the user is experiencing it. Not three hours later or in the evening or one hour stay at the lab. You want to have and measure it now. You need to know what's happening with your user right now so you can actually uh, understand and get some understanding of what is happening with the user. And more specifically, my interest is definitely addressing the attention fatigue. And I guess when I say attention fatigue, we, I will not explain what that is. We have all experienced this, especially over the past two years. So how ultimately do we make a variable, a truly variable BCI? Um, there is actually quite a few uh, variable everyday examples of devices and tools we are already using, and I did mention them in the beginning, like glasses, for example. There is a lot of research prototypes, but also commercially available tools that um, allow for a lot of modalities to be picked up. For example, the first line of this table you can see is uh, the system is called 
uh, a month ago, and that was uh, picking up the EDA, so this opt alert system to wake up truck drivers when they are falling asleep. Uh, the next one, you see a lot of ways to deliver information. For example, uh, one DEI were from Google from a couple years ago that they published. It would actually, the little LEDs would indicate you the uh, direction you need to turn your bicycle or your car. Uh, a view and focals acquired by Google, which lenses with uh, uh, information. Uh, there's quite a few that are doing information delivery and sensing, specifically uh, this is spectacles, uh, both audio frames, which is audio uh, modality, and quite a few others. There is some with physiological sensing, which is very exciting, like these focus. I believe they are, or they have been discontinued already, but actually those are holding EEG sensors on the tips of the ear. There is um, a Blueberry, uh, which is our two-channel FNIRS variable system, also can be just uh, stuck to any pair of the glasses, or Jinsmin, Japanese company doing EOG, electroculography. However, uh, a lot of them, a lot of these devices, again, do not help with attention fatigue. More importantly, what a lot of these devices do, they will, great device, easy, nice to handle, but uh, they would force you <laughs> to use an app that comes with it, which is okay. However, to actually know something about yourself or getting an alert, most of these devices do not have anything on board they have the app dedicated for it. So for example, if I want to know how, how am I doing actually right now while I'm giving the talk, I need to take a phone to look at the app. That's not really helping any anyhow for me to stay focused, to stay in the flow. And it doesn't help anyhow for actually improving any of the current states. So what we have proposed is we have proposed a device that combines the physiological sense and the feedback on board without using visual stimulation. So we call the system attentive view, and this is a pair of glasses. It has uh, EEG electrodes on the tips of the ears, and it has EOG electroculography sensors. Uh, for those who are not aware, those pick up the eye movement activity without the use of the cameras. What is important about the device is that it also has the auditory and haptic feedback, so high pitch tone um, that can be provided, um, or vibrations that can be provided to the user who is wearing the device in the moment or whatever the situation is. Meaning that you do not need to uh, check the app if you need, for example, to have the device do a notification for you. A notification is not notification about a new message, a new email. Notification meaning that something within your state is different and you actually might want to uh, take care of yourself or do something about that. So this is how two iterations of the device look like in the driving environment where we have actually published papers in, in the setup. So what we have done over the past five years is we have published quite a few papers with 300 users with over 200,000 of uh, hours of recordings. And we have tripled the number of devices since 2021. And we have explored the driving uh, uh, use case. So users who have been uh, actually falling asleep in the driving simulator overnight, and we have been waking them up. Uh, lectures in real classrooms, training materials, work from home environment, safety, internal, external visual attention and imagery I have already talked to you about. We also work with users who have ASD, LS users. But what is the most important uh, that we are doing the studies out of the lab for the past two years. Meaning that what you might need to think for your experiment, for your setup, what you're looking at is what would be the best device or form factor for you and for your use case. You might not need to make the choice of, oh, I need to make sure that it is the best data. If you're going out, it's gonna be messy at times. You just need to embrace that. It's going to be messy. We have users living next to the power plants. Yep, yep, that happened. Found it out after one week when the data was absolutely unusable. That happens. You would have users or their animals chewing on device. Happened. Everything happens. However, what is very important that 
when you have continuous, continuous streaming of the data over hours and hours of everyday use, even with few sensors, you definitely can get extremely useful and interesting insights. But you need to make user want to wear the device, meaning that it needs to solve the problem. Again, when you're looking also, and this is one of the lessons we also learned, when you're looking at devices which have very few sensors, very few electrodes, you might really benefit of getting another modality or modalities if possible. For example, in this case, uh, only two EEG sensors, uh, definitely not a lot. You cannot do all of it, obviously, but we have another modality, which is actually pretty powerful, which is eye movements. All of these use cases, which we have published, do talk about use of the eye movements, uh, even with auditory attention, as an example. So that is something you need to think about as well. What is the use case you are trying to solve? What additional modality can help you solve the challenge or add on something that would be beneficial if another one fails? That's something that you would want to think about. But now let's change the gears. Let's have some fun. Let's have some break. Natalia, we don't have sound. Maybe you want to activate the checkbox oh, in. Let me see. So when you share your presentation, there's a little checkbox to enable computer sound sharing. It must let be ticked. See. There was no sound just now, so that was fine. But let me check. I think that's fine, but let me try again. So what's the reason for having yellow and blue colors behind you? Yes, of course, there is a reason. And I mean, again, it's a business school, uh, but there is also a reason why I picked the photo, of course, um, with the old current situation and war in Ukraine. Again, this is a lab setup that was actually painted long before situation happened. But yeah, it's a um, you know, way of uh, encouraging to stop this uh, senseless aggression. I was just wondering if this was done before or afterwards. It was actually done, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people ask, it was actually done uh, before, or long before. That was default all the time. I don't know, from the very beginning maybe of the building. Maybe what was from the very beginning of the building was built. But I think it's very, very nice. It's the lab set up and uh, warms my heart personally when I actually pass by. So that's very sweet. Um, you find I the button? Uh, I did not actually. I so don't when you see... click on the share screen button, there's a little checkbox. Yeah. Yep. Which is. And my, I do have share sound. Share sound. So, yeah, I yes. do have it selected. Yeah. So hopefully yeah. that would. Gotcha. I'm just picked up uh, and double checked my settings. So hopefully it will work out. No. Okay, hopefully you can see it again. And if it doesn't work, I can narrate it for you. But you know what? You should oh, it works. Okay. It works. Perfect. Hmm. Difficult. Very difficult. Plenty of courage, I see. Not a bad mind either. There's talent. Oh, yes, and a thirst to prove yourself. But where to put you? Not Slytherin. Not Slytherin. Not Slytherin. I don't know, Christoph, you need to tell me. Did you recognize, recognize where that is coming from? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so I unfortunately I cannot hear a lot of you for now only Kristoff but I do hope you recognize this little uh coffee movie break we just had um that was from Harry Potter for those of you who I still like it do not know what I'm talking about I highly recommend to check it out <laughs> However, this little break was uh, done on purpose to refresh your minds and to change a bit the scenery because we're going to continue talking about brain sensing, but we're going to look at completely different use case that could be as powerful, if not more powerful. The system we uh, have here is called Thinking Cap. It's as a not as a sorting hat you just saw from the movie. So what we have designed, and again, we published, there are several studies actually uh, on this one. We are looking on improving self-esteem, uh, motivation, and performance in children. So the system here has an EEG headset, actually there are a few of them. I'm gonna uh, guide you through this one. And it has also a speaker. Uh, and um, I'm gonna tell you what it tells. It doesn't tell you exactly which house you're in. It's doing a bit better thing, but Overall, why to do that? Uh, you might know that there is a lot of challenges academia is facing with the mindset interventions. For those who do not know, uh, Carol Dirk and others uh, from Stanford University uh, proposed the fixed and growth mindset. And the idea is that if you are having a growth mindset, mindset that should be promoted in academic setup, it's when you can embrace errors you're doing and it is totally fine to, you know, to mess up, to make a mistake, to not be perfect. No one is perfect. The idea is that you learn on your mistakes, you grow, it can be hard, it can be an uphill battle, but it is challenging, uh, but it is wonderful. And in a lot of uh, setups that is cu currently being proposed, it's a workshop. So I would say a set of trained adults would come over to the schools online in some case, obviously for the past two years mostly, and they would do these interventions. However, um, in a lot of cases, not even over the past two years, but obviously much longer, this paper, I believe it's from 2010 or 2011 actually, uh, there is sometimes phrasing that is being told by the teachers or by the caregivers, not on purpose by any means, actually is as an encouragement as to keep up with what's happening. But this phrasing can be challenging for a child to, uh, to actually address. For example, it's okay, not everyone can be good at math. This is done as a quote from the teacher uh, while uh, teaching a math class. Again, uh, nothing uh, bad might have come from the phrase itself. However, someone can take it as, I don't need to do math, I'm not good in it, and that's it. But that's not true. The idea is to persist and to try more, and it's okay if it's not perfect and you will not have a perfect A on your score today or tomorrow or even in a month or two or three. That is totally fine. So the idea is, is there a way we can potentially maybe uh, build some type of an artifact, some type of a tangible system can potentially help with these instructions, with these classes, with the teachers and instructors, or maybe caregivers who are actually uh, willing to empower the, the children, also show them a bit of this growth mindset theory. So actually quite a lot of research had been already done. And again, I do uh, suggest you checking our papers on that one. But um, as an example, uh, perceiving magic and mindset interventions actually was proven to be extremely powerful. A lot of studies were published where if you're watching a movie, a child is watching a movie and it has some magic into it, there, and then there is a mindset test being uh, performed just before and after the movie uh, was actually uh, presented to a child. They would score higher and magic does boost the mindset. It's a superpower, a superhero. I think some of us did experience this even as being adults. Also, for example, this is an uh, example of a um, curriculum that was designed uh, by um, um, US teachers actually, and they propose it literally taken from Harry Potter. You might remember some of these phrases if you can watch, I will never mimic the words, but you are saying it's wrong. It's Leviosa, not Leviosa, et cetera. You might recognize it. Or, you know, I don't know anything about magic. Don't worry, Harry. You learn fast enough, everyone starts beginning at Hogwarts. And these are just examples that 
mistakes help me grow and I cannot do that. And that is totally fine. You will learn. So these are actually posters that are printed in some of the classrooms uh, from Harry Potter. And last but not least example from the state of the art, uh, there's a lot of different personality traits and tests. I'm pretty sure everyone on this call have done one at least once. Raise your hands if you have, <laughs> guilty here. But actually, again, and this is very much, oh, I read Gryffindor, and I, it, it sounds almost funny when I talk about that because people think, oh, but like even the franchise is not really like, it's kind of gone, there's now a new one, etc. But as of last year, <laughs> there is over 25 million people who took a test to which house they belong in Harry Potter. And you know what? When you're told that you are belonging to Gryffindor, you are feeling braver. You are feeling better about yourself. Just as an example, depending on the house preference, you will absorb some of the traits of the house or, uh, you know, their neighborhood or the classroom or environment uh, or in general uh, what you are actually being told you are leaning towards regardless of the universe and again these are uh, also being all tested and published I do encourage you to check the paper to actually have all these um, super interesting references and last but not least when I mentioned that uh, different uh, educators come over they do come over obviously with this posters about plasticity of the brain, about explaining neuroscience, explaining how you can learn and how you can learn anything. And that is okay to not know or not understand something in the very beginning. So these actually neuroscience is being a uh, part. Some of them do bring actual three printed models of the brain and explain how the brain works. So that is also being a part of the curriculum to improve mindset and it have been shown that that actually also works. So what we have done here in our contribution, we have tried to actually reunite all these three big components, the magic, the pop cultural reference, but also the neuroscience. So obviously magic familiarity. So do you actually know it? Here picture taken uh, by myself in Florida in the shop of Oli Wonder who <laughs> sells the magic phones. Pop cultural reference, do you know the universe? Like here is the Star Wars universe. And of course, neuroscientific component to it. And so this is what we have actually had as main uh, part of our contribution. And what we try to do, we try to build this artifact. Uh, it's more a system. So, and we have first taken several different headsets and masks from superheroes. You can see here 12, you might recognize some of them, Avengers, Captain America, Black Panther, Thinking, sorting head, uh, Magneto, Iron Man. So most of them do have something to do with brain or mind control powers per se. Tiara Wonder Woman, for example, etc. We have used several headsets here. We have used, again, Unicorn. We have used their module. We have used also the research edition of um, uh, Muse headband. I will explain why we had these choices. Uh, and we have obviously interconnected everything so it's not fully like a variable variable system uh, we have uh, had integration with the computer to have everything running smoothly and we also in addition to everything we took a little open source uh as per case for a robot which uh, a child could actually move using their brain activity so this is all the main parts of the system and so why they were so different these are just some examples so there is much more photos and images and videos in the paper again please uh, go ahead and check those it's because of the form factors some we needed to fit all of those artifacts with some set of sensors some of some of them were like wonder woman's tiara they were very slim and sleek and it needed to feel comfortable children are specifically sensitive to when it doesn't feel comfortable they don't like spikes that much they don't it's very important to make sure it is comfortable so there is a whole set of talks I can give about doing BCI with minors actually but this is one example so in another example like what have we used in another we had used unicorn so again where it feels comfortable enough and so a child can actually wear the system and more important can make a contact based on the artifact itself so as you can imagine it will be a bit harder possible but a bit harder to get a teeny tiny band with their uh, sorting hat however the beauty of it being huge and bulky and crazy looking 
everyone wants to wear that and everyone wants to try that on, even adults. We had multiple conditions. So there is a lot of, obviously we needed to test for feedback. We, need, we needed to give random feedback. We had control groups, uh, different permutations. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of things in, in play. And as the protocol is actually pretty heavy. And again, it's two papers over 150 children. So it's a lot of work we put into it. It was multiple years of work actually. Again, I will not be able to go through all of it, but just to give you just how it looked like. So Dwerk designs a theory of mindset intervention. So there is a set of questions where you can measure what is the mindset right now and then after intervention happens. And what she proposed, she proposed to give a child a choice, meaning that you measure, you evaluate the mindset intervention as a mindset of the child, and then you will invent whatever, propose the intervention. Uh, it can be with an artifact, it can be as an adult, whatever you prefer. And then once intervention is over, you will evaluate it. And how would you evaluate it? So there is a change. Obviously you will ask questions, sure. The questions would be about persistence, about enjoyment, etc., etc. But what you're gonna do in between these mindset questions and intervention? You will ask a child to do a mass test, for example. And before the intervention happens, you will give them the mass test of the level of difficulty. For example, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, it would correspond. However, once the intervention is over, whatever intervention was, artifact, a human, uh, voice, speaker, you will give them a choice to take a mass test again, but either of the same difficulty, so of their level, a simpler one or a much harder one. So that's what you would want to look at. Which one would they pick? Would they go for the same one? Or would they feel challenged enough to pick up the one that is really hard? It's usually really hard. It's above their level. Also, there is a much more since in between, there is ways of how you would ask the questions about the mindset, you not know, to prime children. You would need to ask uh, what is a favorite and least favorite subject. It does you know, change since if math is a favorite subject, for example, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we had multiple control groups. That's why there's control group, random group, et cetera, et cetera. What is more importantly, inside of each artifact, there was a speaker and the speaker was talking to a child. And the phrase and it was saying uh, is not, oh, you're doing great. That's, a, that's an example of a fixed mindset. The example of the growth mindset you are working so hard on your problem. That is really great. That's an example. So that's, and again, this is based on the prior work on the growth mindset. So how, what you record, what is being told to a child, what type of encouragement. It's not just an encouragement. It's actually most of the cases, just an encouragement is a fixed mindset. That's how you put the sentence that it is actually a growth mindset. Again, um, quite a few groups, a lot of permutations, in a lot of controls, we will have just the artifact. We will have artifact with EG. We'll have artifact without EG. EG alone. We will have control group, which is just uh, an experimenter. So as if it was a real setup, regular, just a person, you know, doing that. So just, for example, encouragement. Oh, great. You're working really hard on these problems. Um, that's great. So that's kind of the control group. So again, I do encourage you to check the paper for all the details, all the questions, how you position it, et cetera. And of course, very importantly, though we did not explain to the child the full, full extent of the experiment, we didn't give them these details. When they came with their parents, with their caregivers for the experiment, we did give them the consent form, of course. They both were entitled to each of, of their uh, family pair or caregiver, caretaker, and the child entitled to their own consent forms. But what we did very explicitly, we did two things. We did, from the very beginning, we explained the B, what BCI is. So we took eight to 12 years old. So they were able to grasp the concept. And we explained that this is not a magic. It's a scientific tool and it's not going to be perfect. So we made sure from the very beginning that there is no notion that there is some magic happening, anything like that. Even if afterwards maybe they felt there was a bit of magic to it, we were very explicit in writing and in explanation what is they going to actually wear 
and that it is not a matrix. It's very, very important. So there is no line in this sense. We just didn't explain about choices of tests, et cetera, et cetera. So we didn't obviously disclose a full setup, but we did disclose everything about the BCI systems that we're using. And we also, once the experiment was over, we did debrief them in depth. Uh, that was very important that they're not, they're not leaving the lab with some false uh, beliefs about BCI or magic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So here is just very quickly some of the examples, how they look like, different form factors. Uh, and here's a little video. They could also, in addition to listening to what the device, so in this case, Magneto's helmet, for, for those who, who know the Avengers universe, what it was telling them, they also could have, they had a five minute robot control. And this was throughout all of the control. So maybe we thought, you know, maybe it's just enough to put like a, a helmet on you and let you play with a little robot and you can control it. So again, I do uh, suggest you check in the paper because we try to really have a lot of controls to ensure that it's not just a primed effect of, wow, there is some EEG there and it does something that I think about, etc., etc. Check the little video here. I'm not sure if you can actually see their EEGs there very well, but that's kind of the idea. It was just there inside. Also very important, you can actually see this in front of the uh, in front of the uh, our little participant here. She actually has it's upside down, so definitely not a good quality. They chose the here in this study that you are seeing the video from, as I said, we did have several published. They chose what they want to be, what do, what they like. So if you don't like Harry Potter or you don't know what Harry Potter is, go ahead, be my guest, be a Wonder Woman, be a Black Panther, be whatever you want to be. So that's important. However, again, to address some maybe of the questions popping up, we did have a control and there was no choice. So it was just the Harry Potter head. And um, so everyone knew what Harry Potter is and was at the age of eight and nine. They do not; they were not always exposed to the books or movies just yet. So they actually did not know what the head is supposed to do, or that it is from that universe, or they haven't seen. So they heard Harry Potter, but they have not seen the concept of their uh, head in action per se. Again, uh, to preserve the time, I'm not going to go in depth about the um, results. Again, everything is in the paper, everything is published, but we do have a um, significant improvement on the post mindset uh, questionnaire, and we definitely have uh, for the persistence scores, we do have some significant results in everything that is we call hero act, meaning that where there was an EEG present and also the artifact that EEG was under. Uh, meaning this tiara or the head or the mask. Definitely a lot of interesting insights we can learn from, but specifically, obviously there is a lot of potential limitations of future work to, to work through. There is still, even if we're trying to address the priming issue and challenge, there's definitely still potentially magic element that we have biased the uh, children with. There's definitely BCI accuracy that we would need to evaluate because we have used different sets headsets and electrodes throughout to actually feed them nicely and tightly. So that, that was really uh, not the perfectly equilibrated control, depending on what children picked up as a hero. In some of cases, they picked up all the time something like with one headset or with a headband, et cetera, et cetera. It's definitely still a pretty small number. I mean, we are proud of the amount of uh, participants we had, but definitely per group, it's still, I would treat it as preliminary. So all the results are significant. It's a, I would say that the hypothesis were not rejected, but I would definitely call this a preliminary. And there is just duration of intervention. It was one hour, but with the effect last, we are doing something in this direction as of now, as a spoiler alert, but definitely there's a lot of questions will this last. Some of the interventions on average are between three minutes to a half an hour for mindset. So we definitely are within what have been done before, but that's something to actually investigate further along. But we do think there is a lot of potential for the ad tech here. Definitely STEM, adding this magic to science. We have all these tools. We can put them out there. They are available, they're accessible. There's a lot of 
uh, obviously hackathons happening at schools, definitely. There is a lot of, um, we did have the system to be brought to schools by some of our participants and that yielded some great uh, results. And obviously there's a strong effect of empowerment. Again, whatever you want to be. Just to finish before we dive into questions, there is, I want to make sure that this is very important to be highlighted. There is a lot of design guidelines we follow. We try to enhance quality of life by translating brain and behavioral science for real world use cases while engaging in critical conversations. And we design these target users, enable rather than enforce, teach rather than make dependent. And we do keep the data private and we explain how it is being processed, changed, and what will happen with it. There is definitely much more to be said about the ethics considerations of any of the systems I have talked to or I have not talked, but even throughout the whole BCI school, you will be all experienced. And I guess, for Christoph, to your point, what would be the question? <laughs> the question is, what do you think of you know, ethical considerations, how we need a society to move forward? And this is a very open question. You know, We need to ask about the brain sense and overall. Uh, a takeaway message from me would be also checking this amazing three-pager from nature. Uh, separating neuroethics from neurohype. Uh, if this is a takeaway, get screenshot that it's great, it's amazing, highly recommend. And of course, call for action. We want your brain for science. And for that, uh, take screenshots of this image if you liked, and specifically like different sci-fi direction, but also fiction and science of brain sensing. We do have at the moment an art installation at the lab at um, uh, MIT. In case you're around or you will be around, it will be for quite few, uh, some time. You can check it also out and also help us with a little test where you can learn uh, something more about ethics and challenges of BCIs, but also win a prize. And there is definitely a lot to be said about the future and sensing beyond the eyes. Adam touched upon on that uh, just before. There's a lot of sensing that we didn't explore further that can only uh, empower us to do more on the side of everything that is related to the brain sensing. Additional modalities are definitely a cue here. Thank you so much for having me. This was really nice. Uh... Look at the chat and take a screenshot or a video because it's so long. Screenshot doesn't capture it. Wonderful presentation. This is phenomenal, Dr. Kosmian. It's been beautiful blend of fun and knowledge. Somebody was saying this was the pe best talk of all the conferences he has ever seen. So it cannot be better. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> they, they like Harry Potter and Iron Man and so on. <laughs> Um, Lina, well, let's start with Haupt. He's asking if you collect data outside the lab over a long period of time, how yes. do you deal with the non-stationary of the brain? And what are the major lessons that you have learned with data from only two electrodes? Yeah. So first of all, main lesson, if you can teach your um, subject, you know, caretaker what the data is supposed to look like. So we do provide them with visual support. So we do spend some time with them to teach them. This is the data that is noisy. We try to be very high level, but we explain to them, this is something is often with the environment, maybe doesn't for us to do the session right now. This works very well with our caretakers. This works very case with users who have some type of disability, but the same for their users who are having actually just to use on everyday basis and they don't need any help to install the device on them or to put it on. You just want to make sure that first, you're very clearly, that, that I hope that was a very clear message. Tell what you're measuring, why you need that, and how you measure it. We don't say in our app that goes with the devices, we are measuring attention. And I think I did make this very clear. We explain why, which type of attention, how we try to get sure that that's attention and not something else. And also we do show them, again, the how they can check for the signal quality that they need to do it from time to time. And we explain them very well where it can go off, like, you know, living next to the power plant, which we discovered, like, that was a great example, but obviously not everything is so dramatic, but just explaining them, you are getting it into more homework, in more work from home environment, no point to worry it, when you're going to go for a jogging, <laughs> well, there are some systems that does it, I saw papers, like, from Australia, like, yeah, 
Christophs develop in some sense, also you can do it on the move. But in our case, we don't do that. Specifically, of the form factors, they are still being pretty fragile. But what you need to learn, and this is amazing, from 19 months of using the system for some of our participants, using the system for 19 months, you will have 100 gigabyte of data from a user. It's four channels, it's five channels, it's three channels, but you have over one gigabyte of data per user. One user, sure, but how much you will have. And this activity would be repeating and repeating and repeating itself. We also do a lot of training, of course, uh, meaning that it's not, oh, we do training in the beginning and you're never gonna redo the training. So it's something to, to really consider. I'm gonna just speed up here to make sure that we can maybe answer some other questions, but there's a lot of other things. I'm gonna give in depth talk soon on what we have learned and how actually you design it, how you build it, what is the back end looks like. There's a lot of things to consider if you want to do it. It's not a simple switch from the lab to the outside. Another question is from Lina. How do you handle all the noise in variable sensors that collect hours and hours of continuous data? Yeah, so this, we, we definitely do, obviously, when we do analysis, it's very important. We always do data collection processing, classification. So, and these are very, very different, I would say, and we pointed in a lot of papers, even with our lab set up, that it's important, what do you want to do? Do you want to actually account for the noise? Because the data will be always noisy. Or do you want to show and, you know, clean up and have this data set shipped to someone, you know, like to the community outside, et cetera, if your users agreed on that. So that's very, very important. You basic artifacts, don't forget that we are using in some cases modalities that is ultimate artifact, which is like EOG, like eye movements. We use it, we enable it, we need it, we want it. In some cases, we don't have it, we don't need it, and the form factors are different, like headbands, and you definitely can do automatic, you know, channel rejection, again, you need to be careful with everything that is asymmetric, symmetric components and what you're going to reject. So you really will, first you will learn how to collect the data and then you will learn what your data can and cannot give you. So you cannot do, by the way, it's also very important. Even if you're a big team, you'll not be able to do all of it simultaneously. You really need to first have the pipeline, make sure the data is not leaking. And then you will be able to see what actually you're getting. Is it noise, noise, noise? Is it something useful? Can you actually somehow event base it in the app that you have? What is what you need? And that's exactly my whole point was, you need to understand what you need. So how you can ensure that out of five hours I have been wearing it, you maybe got 30 minutes. Maybe you should not tell them that you only got 30 minutes, but that you got it and it is actually either in sync, it's either app synced, you have some events, so you actually can see at least maybe training data quality each day they're doing it. Maybe next three hours they're gonna do it, it's not gonna be good. And you need to leave it, you know, you need to be embracing the fact that you're gonna cut it. But if you have it each single day, that's also something super important. Sounds very good. Do you see the painting behind me? Yes, I do. So Dragan Illich painted that with a brain-computer interface and a cooker robot that does electronica. And I was trading in the painting via a brain-computer interface. And maybe you have heard of a naked unicorn. So <laughs> this, this, this yes. BCI system would actually fit perfectly into your Harry Potter hat. Maybe I can trade in a naked unicorn versus a BCI-controlled Harry Potter hat. Did you hear? I think it snapped off of the slide. We used the unicorn for both the uh, XR use case with the HoloLens, and we used it also for the head, actually. Not for the head. As, as I mentioned, it didn't fit all, all, all of the form factors because back at the time, we didn't have naked version. We had like the original, no, not made, dressed up unicorn we had. So we still pulled yeah, yeah, it the, the 3D yeah, form yeah. factor doesn't fit yeah. to, to all yeah, these yeah, that, masks. That thing, but yeah, the naked that, one would be Yeah, would be totally. Nice. Mm. And mm. definitely um, also a very important, I guess, point before we move forward, I see that there is another speaker, I guess, lined up. Uh, even in the papers on like where we have produced like a 10 TV paper, we did validate originally with like has it as GTAC, uh, just to make sure that, you know, and I think I see this in any single paper that releases or prototype in the lab, out of the lab, validation of around ear pieces, et cetera, where you would want to make sure that what you're recording and you do this, you know, kind of testing in the lab. So you can actually compare 
to their lab grade systems. So you actually know what you're looking, but it's also good to know when you know what features you're already looking at. When it's very, very explorative, you might not want to start with very few sensors. That's not usually the way to do. So that's also something very, very important to do uh, and just to keep in mind. At the end of the spring school, we have a very difficult exam, you know, MIT like. <laughs> <Yes>. MIT. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, leak, I need the most difficult MIT question that I can ask the attendees. What would you ask? Um, definitely very, very hard. You know, we always say MIT stands for make it harder, no, make it tougher. <laughs> That's what it stands for, for sure. It's not like message Institute of technology, by the way. It's like, <laughs> don't tell anyone I said this. Oh my God, it's a being live streamed. <laughs> but uh, the idea that I would definitely then mention, I would ask about ethics. It's, it's important. It's open-minded, so let it be the easiest. But honestly, I think that will be the toughest question you can ask for the school. What actually... What do they think the future would look like? Uh, they might be excited, they might be frightened, but what do they think they can do, we can do as society together with people who develop, with researchers? We definitely cannot take all it on ourselves. We need to work with the end user, we need to work with society, with the lawmakers uh, to actually be ensure that it's not going to turn into next not going to say it, but going to say it, Facebook or something like that. So to ensure that it actually serves a purpose, it serves its quality, it is useful and it helps you instead of taking your attention and mental capacities and not what not from you. So that's the question. Ask them what would we do and how we can move forward from ethical, you know, and how we can address some of the ethical considerations. So this was very nice, great to have you. Where you are coming from, actually? It's, it's originally, originally, I mean, I'm French, but originally I actually was born in Ukraine. So, yep. Very nice. It's just 400 kilometers from Austria. Pretty close. Yes, it is. You know, to be honest, I have just flown through Austria in December to see my parents in Ukraine. So, yep, just flew through Vienna. Yep. So, I live in a very small village here with 1,500 people and I have a couple of very good Ukraine friends living also here. 